Welcome to the Shiro's of Beijing Stories, the podcast series, brought to you by UN Women Nigeria and Women in Successful Careers, WISCA. In this series, we would be sharing and celebrating stories of women's activism in Nigeria. The women in this podcast were present in the Fourth World Conference on Women, popularly tagged Beijing 1995. And their extensive and impactful experience and commitment to the empowerment of women is why we continue to celebrate them. At Whisker, we believe in the power of a shared story in leading the next generation to aspire, grow, and contribute to nation building. We hope you will be inspired as you listen. Nice to be back. In this episode, I will be in conversation with Madame Jane Osage. Jane Osage is a trained social worker and educationist, an African feminist with a fever pitch passion for equal rights and justice for the female gender. She has been in the forefront of gender equality and women empowerment since the early 90s. With an unimpeachable track record in the struggle, having had experiences in research pertaining to sexual and reproductive health and rights of women, with expertise in adolescent sexuality and cultural religious practices against women and girls, she has contributed her wealth of experience in several resource materials and presentations. Jane has led several organizations. Such as Women in Nigeria, IRAG, and the Coalition Against Trafficking in Persons in Edo State. She has done some notable work on gender mainstreaming and advocacy, including in the areas of female genital mutilation, widowhood rights, HIV/AIDS prevention, and mitigation. She is also a member. Of several NGO, government boards, and professional and Christian religious bodies, she is married with children and grandchildren. So, welcome, Madam Jane Osage. It's good to have you here today in conversation with me on this podcast. And welcome once again. So let's get started. In、okay. the book, The Shiras of Beijing, you referred to the importance of developing African-centered research based tools that would catalyze the success of building a strong, sustainable women's movement. Why do you think an Afrocentric approach to gender activism is important?、Uh, first and foremost. <laughs> I want to thank the UN Women and Whisker for putting this together. I strongly believe in Afro-centered or Afri-centered、uh, approach because, like it is said globally, that the world has become a global village.、Mm. Yes, but even in becoming a global village, we still have to be able to identify and locate our hearts within the village. And that means for African women, black women, we have issues that are peculiar to us. We need to be able to form, to put down or identify our challenges, and then approach it in a way that suits us.、Mm. We cannot be subsumed by the global language of "oh, it's a global village." We need to be able to identify such things like. We still hold on tightly to family ties. Yes, we still have communal lives. We have respect for elders. We still have value for marriage and the sanctity of marriage. These are gradually fading away from the Western culture, but we should not just be swept away. So we need to be able to have tools that address our issues particularly. And they will be able to proffer solutions using such tools. We have adages that support women. 
that highlight the potentials of African women, especially in Nigeria. We should be able to use such adages, such folklore to address issues and find solutions that suit our particular purposes and issues. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Ma. So basically, we need to focus on tools that are culture centered. And, you know, because, you know, I suppose as Africans, sometimes we often feel like, you know, everything West is best. But yet there is so much, you know, there is so much good in our own, especially when we look at like at last year, how, you know, the importance of family and support and, you know, networks and that thing that it's sort of very, you know, cultural to us really came to play. Um, I think there's a lot, you know, there's a lot there to learn in terms of just, you know, bringing the best of what is ours, you know, even to this conversation about gender and gender activism. So thank you very much for that, Ma. Okay, you also clearly believe in structured mentorship and coaching for the next generation of women activists. And of course, you know, last year you were a part of our Pioneer Mentors on the Mm -hmm. Beijing Plus 25 Mentorship Program. And you reference in your contribution to the book, The Series of Beijing, the importance of documenting her stories. Can you kindly share Mm -hmm. your thoughts on the importance of telling our own stories and investing in documenting the stories of gender activists who've gone before? Thank you very much, Fabian. I strongly believe in structured mentorship and coaching because as an educationist, Although I'm a social worker also, but I'm first and foremost trained as an educationist. We were taught, and I believe in it, that the brain of a child is like a tabula rasa, a plain thing. You have to scribble on it. And whatever you scribble is what the children learn. I believe also in the school of thought that says we learn everything in life. Mm. Let me give an illustration. When a child is born, the child is taught to circle. And then the child is taught to sit, learns to sit, learns to walk, take the first step, and then starts to run. So we must put these things in perspective so that we follow it gradually. Mm. When you mentor a child with the right tools, with the right information, that child is likely to grow up in that way. Like my Bible says, train up a child the way he or she will grow. Yes, and when that child old, is grown, will, the child will go. Yes. Not even grow. You know, teach a child the way he will go or she will go. When he's grown, he will not depart from it. Mm. So we need to be able to structure these things. And like we have a very rich past. We had the lights of Queen Amina, the likes of Queen Idia of mm, the mean, City. Yes. We had the likes of Anikula Akbar and so many of them. We need to document these things. Even now, in this modern day of uh, the women's movement, we still have those who are living, or uh, some who are already passed, like Professor Jade Shola Akonde, BC or Lateru or Lagbegi, Mama BC or Gunleye. We need to be able to document these things. We have a rich culture. Even for those women who are still living, like Madame Oyegbola, for instance, like myself, Grace Osakwe, Professor Bene Madunagu. You know, we need to document these things. And when we are leaving this legacy for the successor generation, they should be able to know that they have a rich heritage that they can learn from. Women were there and women are there who fight through strong patriarchy to still fight for their rights. Mm. Like the past women I mentioned, patriarchy is very strong. The culture also promotes some of these things against the women. But yet these women were able to stand Mm. and claim their rights. So we really need to have a structured program that will tell how to move from one step to the other. And that's what makes the difference between social work and social health. Mm. An African woman, an average African woman or a Nigerian woman is a social helper, always ready to right. help the neighbor, the mother-in-law, mm. the sister-in-law and all of that. But true. when it becomes social work, it is now 
no, you have to apply skills. Take yes. one step, no, after the other. So we need to actually have these things in place and document it. We can't allow those our heroes past, their achievement to just you know, be wished away or washed away. But we need to document it for ourselves and for successful generations. Thank you so much, Ma. And, you know, you make a very interesting point, you know, about our rich culture and the importance yes. of, you know, living behind the legacy. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny on this podcast series, you know, Mrs. Zoragwala has been challenged as we talk about documentation. She herself has been challenged to write her book. And oh, I am yeah. now challenging you, Ma, to make sure that you write Correct. your your biography so that, you know, those <laughs> of us coming behind can learn more. I mean, the series of Beijing, the book, obviously documents some of that story, but it's very contextualized. And, you know, we would definitely love to hear more about you know, the Thank fantastic Thank you. Even work. my son. Yes. Sorry. But a month or two months ago, my son yes, just son. called me and said, Mommy, do your biography. Exactly. Exactly. Do something. Write this thing down, you know. Document it. And I said, okay, I'll be looking at it. And now you have seconded it. So yes. So I, so I it must be done. <laughs> Thank you. We look forward to that. Okay. So still on the point of documentation, yes. when we do, so when we have, when we then, as, you know, as the call has been to begin to, you know, have this body of work, when we do eventually, you know, sort of get, you know, a critical mass of work out there, what are the channels then, you know, what would you say would be the channels to ensure that, you know, the right audience receives it? and consumes it so it's you know it's all well and good to say let's document our stories let's document our stories but how then do we now ensure that it gets into the right hands of those who need to have this information what are your thoughts on thank that? god we have a crop of feminists that are coming up hmm. and there are a lot of ngos civil society organizations let's do the documentation first Thank God for information technology yes it can be put on the social media it can be printed Although when it's printed, a lot of people may not read it. It can be put on the internet. Let people know. Let this know. And this through this mentoring too, we should be able to empty ourselves hmm. into the generations upcoming. Yes. Like the eaglets, the begin eaglets, eaglets yeah. you just came up with and, you know, we can empty ourselves into them. It's like handing over a baton. You are running a race. You hand over your baton properly to the next person and the person goes with the vision and runs with it mm. so there are several ways printing information technology a lot of other you no know, ways can yes. be done like this podcast, like this podcast exactly i was going to say yes, like this podcast yes, yes. makes it nice yes. and easy yes yes fantastic yes. So, thank you so much ma okay so yeah. another question for you Still yeah. based on the book, The Shiraz of Beijing. Okay. In that book, you mentioned that your main role model was your father because he actually helped to build your self-confidence and inspired your self-belief. Um, very, very critical. You know, these are sort of values that are very, very, very critical. So today, you know, we would refer to him as a mentor, as your mentor. And yes, yes. Um, we would also refer to him probably as a male feminist, a he for she. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> and indeed, there is now the He for She campaign. So can you yes. speak on the importance of male allies in the support and fight for gender equity and inclusion? And what role should men be playing really in, you know, as we move towards what we consider as feminists to be the good society? Okay. As feminists and as a feminist myself, I do not totally believe that men can be feminists. Mm. They can be pro-feminism. But talking back, you know, speaking to what you just said now, actually, my father was a role model. He was a mentor to me because he believed in me. Mm. He made me feel good about myself. He helped me to develop positive body image and you no know, self-esteem to the extent that whatever I wanted, as long as I could earn it in terms of going to good schools, he was there for me. Hmm. I was one among male children. My mother had seven of us, the only female. Wow. And although he had another wife too, but once you were just intelligent, all he needed was for you to do well in school. And to the glory of God, at that time, yes, I would say I was doing well. And 
he will just give me all the opportunities. I was so close to him to the extent that he taught me virtually everything. Yeah. Wow. Believe it or not, he was the one who taught me about menstrual circles, although he was in the health sector. Yes. He bought me my first pad. That, you know, my first sanitary pad. Yes. And taught me how to use it. That's how close I was to him. So if we can educate the men, starting with the fathers, because the upbringing of a child, it's like bearing a child is the woman's responsibility. But rearing a child should be the responsibility of both the father and the mother. Thank God that in Africa, we talk of a village raising a child. Yes. But things that are intimate, we should be able to talk to our children, give them the right education. When I say the right education now, it comes, it starts with evil sexuality education. Talk to them, make them value themselves. Because there's an adage in Edo language that says, he who has a pan and values it, will wash it and keep it properly. And if you don't keep your pan properly, your neighbor could pick it and trash it. So we should be able to bring in these men at father level, brother level. And that brings me to the fact that why educating these young ones on sexuality education? We should not do it for only the girls. Yes. We should do it for both boys and girls. There should be respect between them. It's not like, oh, the men, the women have been deprived. Yes. But do we want that to continue that it's only when we grow into women, we are now taught what to do, how to defend our steps and all of that? No. So as we are teaching the young girls, as mothers, as fathers, we should also teach our boys to have respect for their sisters. In school, have respect for your co-students that are males and also that are females. Mm. That will help. So. All the levels, men should be involved. But I will, however, say that when it comes to issues particularly addressing women, women should not allow men to take the lead. Because that can always be a mistake. I recall from the first NGO I, I joined, Women in Nigeria, mm. it was basically to defend the rights of women. But when men started to be in positions within the organization, although we was never led by a male, the males inside started to oppress the women even within. So women should always take the lead when it has to do with issues of women mm. that involve the men. My organization, International Reproductive Rights Research Action Group, we have male members. And when we wanted to start the research, I decided that a male member should take part in it. But our international coordinators and some other coordinators, because it's an international organization, said, no, why should male be here? We don't need the males. And I made them to, to realize when we had a meeting in Brazil in 1994, I said, we need these people as allies mm. because we need to teach them. We need to let them know how we feel. We don't need to grow up and begin to take permission from them. You say, if the men allow, if your husband allows you. No, it shouldn't be. You should let your husband know and then, or your male partner know, and then he feels it along with you, the way you feel. We should learn to bring the men to look into the world through the eyes of the women. Mm. Not just, oh, this is the way it has always been done. It has always been done like that because you let half of the population and if half of the population is suppressed, then there will be no progress. We need to be pushing forward for equality because after equality comes development. And after development comes peace. Without equality, there will be no development. And without development, there will be no peace anywhere in the world. So we need to involve the men in these issues, but we should not let them take over issues that have to do with us directly. Fantastic, man. Thank you so much. You've deconstructed yes. the whole concept of male allyship. Carry the men along, yes. particularly to yes. sensitize them, to enable mm -hmm. them begin to look at our world or the world through a gender lens, essentially. They should be part of the conversation. Thank you. Carry them along 
but they shouldn't take mm-hmm. over. Not on women's issues. No, they shouldn't take over. We must still be at the forefront. We of should our do issues. it side by side. Side by side. That's fantastic. Thank now, you. Those days they will say behind every successful man yes. is a woman. No, beside. Beside. We want to be beside so that we see everything that is happening and they to see everything that is happening. It's not a war. Exactly. We are not fighting with each other. Fantastic, Ma. Very well said. And I think we've been certainly enlightened on some of these concepts. So we'll take a short break after these engaging conversations just to listen to one of the critical areas of concern from the Beijing Platform Platform for Action. And we'll be right back. The 1995 Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action flags 12 key areas where urgent action was needed to ensure greater equality and opportunities for women and men, girls and boys. It also laid out concrete ways for countries to bring about change. UN Women works with governments and partners to ensure such change is real for women and girls around the world. Critical area of concern number eight, institutional mechanisms. Specialized institutions have played an important part in informing laws, policies and programs and advancing gender equality. Robust laws and policies coupled with strong mechanisms support various actors and ensure effective enforcement and implementation to push the gender agenda. UN Women works with governments to develop informed national action plans, ensure gender responsive budgeting and strengthen coordination among diverse actors for sustained and meaningful action. We partner with governments, UN agencies, civil society organizations and other institutions to build capacity and increase awareness. We support and advocate for evidence-based policy making. To this end, UN Women stresses the need for sex disaggregated data and played an important role in the development of 52 gender indicators. So welcome back, madam. Let's dive right back in. Let me take you back now, 25 years, to the Beijing, (laughs) the famous Beijing conference, for a moment, if I may. What are your most poignant memories of the conference? And was there a shift in your approach to activism post-Beijing? Obviously, you had been doing a lot of work, you know, in the gender activism space and the gender rights space. Did Mm -hmm. it reinforce your approach for the work you were already doing? Or perhaps did certain things shift? Actually, it reinforced. It reinforced in, in the sense that that was the first time, although I had gone for other conferences, but smaller conferences, I was seeing, you know, huge number of women of different colors, different sizes, different <laughs> educational backgrounds, and yet they were holding on to the same thing. Wow. Believing in the fact that all of us are human beings and to be so treated. You know, first of all, you are a human being before being a woman. And so it made me to know that, you know, if we come together collectively, there's nothing we cannot do. Hmm. Just like Bible said, he said, when, when the people began to build steps to get to heaven, God looked at them and said, because they are united, they will be able to achieve this thing. So let me scatter their language. So women should not allow anybody to come between us. No, because uh, somebody may tell you, this is a black woman, this is a... Even when you are standing, like I said before, in your heart, in different hearts within the global village, hmm. we still know that there are issues that touch on women. It made me to know that coming back, I needed to do more than I was already doing. Believe it or not, that was the first time I was hearing about human trafficking. Okay. Whereas... It, it was already taking place in my own state. I did not know about it. So mm-hmm. issues were raised. 
And we discover that these issues, as they touch the women in the West, that's the way they touch the women in this. So sexual and reproductive health of women, no matter the color, the creed, the age, are the same. But we need to fight it, get angry about issues that are pulling us down. And one of such issues is the use of sexist language. Mm. Because sexist languages exclude us from the main circle. We have been in the bedroom for so long. And now we want to be at the boardroom. And people keep telling you, using culture, you know, there are so many cultural adages, you know, that pull women down. That want you to believe that, oh, where you are is all right. It is not all right until you feel well. Because your health is not just about the absence of disease, like WHO puts it. It's about you feeling happy. Hmm. You being able to express yourself. Total well-being. You being able to say, I can achieve this and go ahead to achieve it. Hmm. Such things like, sometimes people want to say, oh, use the, the, the language man, because hmm. it's used in the Bible. But there are issues even that in the Bible, when women are being addressed, women are being addressed. When it is a man is generic, it's, it's a man. Hmm. Some people would not feel comfortable being called chairwoman. I have been challenged several times and I keep telling them, check your dictionary. It is there. When you say, I accept to be a chairman, sometimes people use it against you and say, oh, did you not see that it's men that are supposed to be there and not you? Do you see the heroes of the past, our past uh, heroes? What about the heroes? We have always contributed to development. We have always contributed to the development of Nigeria. Although we are not reaping the same dividend. To bring democracy into play in Nigeria, women played a lot of role. Like women in Nigeria played a lot of role as an organization. There were so many other organizations that played a lot of role. But today, we are not reaping the same dividend. How many women are in the House of Assemblies? How many women have been governors? How, how they keep telling you it's not the time yet. It's not yet the time. Why? Hmm. When we were contributing to Pulling down militarization in Nigeria, women were there. Some women were detained. Some women were punished. But now that the dividends are coming in, the women are not getting it because they use language to exclude us. And we are going to say no. So we need to be sensitive to the use of language. Language is dynamic. And because it is dynamic and we are moving with it, we should learn to accept. Call me chairwoman. I feel so good about it. Thank that's, you. That's so fantastic, my. Thank you so much. And I just want to take you before I move on to another question on those points you raised. Okay. One was about, you know, one of the power in terms of your memories of Beijing was, you know, the coming together of all these different women and women standing mm. united. Do you feel that that still exists today? And if so, or if not, if so, how can it perhaps be better achieved? That sort of solidarity and unity that, you know, we had 25 years ago. And if not, what can we do to really create, re-energize that feeling again? If we're truly going to move towards seeing real progress, even though some progress obviously has been made. And then the point you make about gender-sensitive language how do we go about that? You know, how can we create more awareness around this issue, which is quite important and which is a whole body of resensitizing women? Because like you said, a lot of men would not even want to be called chairwoman. They're happy to be called chairman, um, you know, mm -hmm. because that is you know, the original position of power. Even for us in the legal profession, you know, they say there are no women at the bar. There are only gentlemen at the yeah. bar. And so we're all gentlemen, so to speak. But we know that that's really not a true connotation because in a way it is excluding as you have said. So how can we just speak a bit briefly on these two issues? Like the use of language, for instance, we have to develop the language we want. Hmm. Shiro of Beijing is a language. Yes. Her story is a language. So such things, we can document them and continue to use organize mm -hmm. campaigns, workshops, and use them. And let the others know that the fact that you are a chairwoman does not mean that that position you are occupying, you are going to perform it's less. It's suddenly lower, yeah. Because you are actually so powerful and intelligent. 
can so we can do it like this documentation we can continue to sensitize other women mm. especially the upcoming feminists and women should not be ashamed of being called feminists mm-hmm. like i always say i am an african feminist I am an African feminist and I am proud to be an African feminist. So we should sensitize other people. Mm. Let them accept these languages. Let the men accept it when they begin to see us use it over and over again. They will accept it. And we should not play into this trick of this broken record of saying women are women's own enemies. When I hear it, even when I hear women say it, <laughs> it, it makes me you know, so I don't angry. upset. You no, know, so angry. You no, know, I didn't want to use that <laughs> word. But it you no, know, it really upsets me. But after a time I began to feel being upset is not going to solve it. I should take it easy and explain to them women are not women's enemies. Men kill men every day. Exactly. Yes, they don't do some things against <laughs> themselves. So we should develop languages, positive languages that will help us. We should help to come together always. Even if we don't come, we can actually come together again like the Beijing conference. Remember, I don't know if you are aware, but when we were going to Beijing, do you know that the media in Nigeria so made it to Mm. look like they were ridiculing us? Mm -hmm. Oh, Women are aware everything is okay now, no trouble in Nigeria again because they've all gathered in Beijing. But on a positive note, like you see a cup half full, and you don't say the cup is half empty, hmm. it is half full. It played to our advantage because everybody now knew that women went to Beijing. And there were just few women, what population of women in Nigeria went to Beijing? But the whole mass media, they were talking hmm. about it. As if everybody and by went. Then we came back. Yes, they were talking about it and that made us to have you know, a full-blown propaganda about it. And we you know, took on the positive aspect of it. What did we go to do in Beijing? We started to talk about it. The likes of Professor Jade Shola Akonde, of blessed memory, she talked about it and she you know, printed books. We were going around the country, organizing workshops. There, you know, people got phones to translate these things into Beijing and started to talk about it, even in local languages. And people were, ah, it means this Beijing thing was important. Mm. And they are talking about it. What exactly is it? It made us know, it focused light on the issues of women more. Mm. So, when things are happening, we should look at the positive side and make good use of it for ourselves. And then we should learn to teach our children that this the world is 100% full of people. And 50% of that population are women. So we can't just wish them away. Because without us, if they move forward, either they wait for us or they step back. But thank God we are not also relenting. Fantastic. I hope I have answered your yes, question. Yes, you have. Okay. You have. So I'm just going to ask a final question now as we bring this interview to a close. In the book, The Shiras of Beijing, you share a number of powerful quotes, one of which is, whatever reduces your self-worth is not good enough for you. Right? And today we've even talked about, right here on this call, about, you know, the importance of well-being and, you know, looking Mm -hmm. after ourselves as, you know, as a total package. So sadly, Mm -hmm. for a number of reasons, including low self-esteem, lack of economic empowerment and cultural norms, Several women feel helpless and powerless. And now I'm speaking specifically to the issue of sexual harassment, assault, and gender-based violence. And this takes place both in the home and in the workplace. You know, many women feel trapped and constrained. What support can be provided to women at home and in the workplace against sexual harassment and gender-based violence? And how can women be encouraged to speak up and amplify their voices in this regard? A part question. Thank, <laughs> yeah. I want to thank you so much and say that the first thing we need to do about sexual harassment, sexual assault, is to speak up and to speak out. And then I enjoin women and men equally, fathers and mothers, 
to help to bring up these children to place value on themselves, like I said earlier, and that when a child is violated or when a woman is assaulted, she should not be the accused person. Mm -hmm. She should be seen as a victim. We should be able to give her a listening ear and women's groups can form you know, support groups for these women. Listen to her. She should be able to have somebody to talk with. And if she talks to you, please, my sister, please, my brother, don't be judgmental. Listen to her. Let her be able to pour out herself. And then we should be able to help. Like in the past, we used to have legal aid centers where if they wanted to pursue these cases, they will get it. Because a lot of these things happen, you may think they happen only to the poor. No, not true. They happen even to educated women. They are battered yes. in their homes and they keep it because of what the society will say, because of stigma. I, I want to say it is time we begin to politicize our private lives hmm. when our lives are in danger. If I am being battered and I cannot speak out because people will laugh at me, then it will be a shame because I may end up dying. So they need support of all forms. We can encourage them by forming support groups as a feminist. We must also continue to press for law reforms that will criminalize these issues. Thank God that they are already opening offenders registers, sex offenders registers mm. in some states. I want and know that every state would open such registers and those people will be identified. Like here where I'm living presently. Sex offenders in this area, do you know that I know them? Hmm. They are marked. You can just Google and put your address on it and it will show sex offenders when they have been released, what they are doing right now, if they are going through reform and all of that. We can't do that in Nigeria. We may think, oh, it's too advanced. It's not because I watch a clip on WhatsApp recently, somebody's laptop was stolen in his car and he was able to use a drone to identify where the thief had gone to and police swat him and were able to recover it. We are talk that's material. Now we are talking about lives Life. being destroyed because somebody who is violated and then is not allowed to speak up, that person is being damaged you find that the person may not be happy all through life. But if you listen without blaming the person, mm. because most times we blame the person. Somebody who has been raped goes into a police station to report the case, and she's being raped by the policemen through their words. How did you dress? Uh, where were you? Uh, how many, you know, how, you know, making her to become the accused instead mm. of the victim. So, a lot of these things will help to address issues, even in workplaces. With the reforms of laws, I'm not saying that sometimes people cannot just falsely accuse others, but when you put things in place, you will be able to know if this person is actually falsely accusing someone else of sexual abuse or harassment, or if the person is speaking the truth. So, but the first point at which we should start is, oh, is this happening to you? Give a listening ear, then follow up, and then you will be able to support such a person. Because a lot of people are not speaking now because of stigma. The women development can help that and, and bring it low. Hmm. That's really interesting, Ma. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on that. And if I can just recap some of the things that you said. You said finding the will you know to do more when it comes to these issues around sexual harassment and, and gender-based violence avoid victim shaming you know at all mm -hmm. costs and instead let's yeah. learn to show empathy let's learn to listen and let's avoid stigmatizing yes there mm -hmm. may be some cases that may have some truth and untruth but it's only in listening and in listening effectively that we can really sort of you know make those value judgments and not judge mm -hmm. for the sake of judging and then you said something really poignant which is we need to begin to learn to politicize our private lives when they are under attack. 
We need to speak yes. up. Soros, okay, yes. as the new gen will say. <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 I heard that. Yes. So, I mean, that it's really been a fantastic time, ma'am, um, spending this last 45 minutes or so in conversation with you. Um, and as I thank you for spending, I, I know we have some time difference, so thank you for waking up early where you are and, um, you know, just being a part of this conversation. It's really been my pleasure to speak with you um, this morning. And um, I just want to, as you sort of close, just to leave some parting words and of advice for our listeners and particularly the next gen who will benefit from these conversations. The world is a beautiful place. And we can create the beauty by what we do, by loving others and seeing others as our equals. We should not, like the Bible will say, esteem yourself above others. Hmm. Learn to show love. Learn to show empathy. And for those who go the wrong way, they should be punished appropriately to serve as deterrent to others. And waking up to be part of this podcast is my life. That is just my life. And that is just Jane beside me. And I'm happy to have worked and to continue to work with Whisker. And I thank you and women for being a big support in this program. And you know, I want to thank all the other mentors and also the mentees who were very willing to learn, even when some of them are good enough as mentors. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ma. It's so been my, a pleasure. Thank, thank you so much, Ma. My regards to the others. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Madam. Thank you so much. And that brings our conversation to a close. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Shiro's of Beijing podcast series. For more insights, follow us up across our social media handles. Follow UN Women on Twitter at UN Women Nigeria. Follow Whisker on Instagram at WhiskerNG and Whisker Nigeria on Facebook and LinkedIn or at Africa Business Radio.